everyone, John Lorden here. Welcome to another episode of Case Cracked. That's right. The show is still around. It's just I can't always fit it in. Thank you for joining me here today. Today we look into a very unfortunate story, but the good thing about Case Cracked is uh, justice is usually on the way in these stories. So please keep that in mind as we discuss the story of 12-year-old Tiali Palmer. Uh, this story takes place in Logan City, Queensland, Australia. Tiali Palmer was a 12-year-old girl taken in by a foster family named the Thorburns. Her biological mother, Cindy Palmer, had been in what she called a severe domestic violence situation and decided it would be best for Tia, as her friends and family called her, to move in with a foster family. The Thorburn home also ran as a daycare with a mother, Juline, a father, Rick, and their two sons, Joshua and Trent. Both sons were into dancing. The home was surrounded by lush landscapes, beautiful views, even horses and other animals. While this sounds like possibly a good fit for a 12-year-old girl, and in particular for Tia, she actually tried running away on several occasions in just her first 10 months of living with the Thorburns. Usually she was found within a few hours and returned home. But things were different on October 30th, 2015. Tia was dropped off by her foster father, Rick, at Marsden State High School at around 8.10 in the morning. Later that day, her foster family would be contacted by a school counselor saying that Tia never made it to class. Everyone figured she would once again be found in a few hours as it happened several times before. However, hours turned into days with no signs of Tia. Rick told investigators that he saw her meet up with a boy before heading into the school gates, but details of the boy were sketchy at best. Six days after she was reported missing, Tia's body was found in the Pampana River by local fishermen. Badly decomposed, the coroner could not determine a cause of death, but a bruise on her scalp was noticed. She was also found almost completely nude. A month later, a shoe possibly belonging to her would be found in the water nearby. But where were her school uniform and her backpack? Who would do this to a 12-year-old girl, and most importantly, why? More than 600 people attended her funeral one week later. Her foster father helped carry her casket, and her brothers even performed a dance routine during the ceremony. Her death prompted new protocols and systems for schools to notify caretakers of child absences in the same day and removed some restrictions that police previously had with issuing media alerts about missing children that were in out-of-home care. Investigators searched for clues, conducting numerous interviews, canvassing the area near where she was found, looking into houses and vehicles, reviewing over 350 records of registered sex offenders in the area looking for suspects. They even offered a reward of $250,000 for information. Of course, a standard investigation method is to rule out the family that she was living with, and investigators were stuck when it came to her foster father, Rick. He had been very clear about their drive to school that morning, even nailing down the amount of time that he stopped to drop her off down to between 30 and 40 seconds. However, when investigators pulled CCTV footage, they found that he did indeed drive by her school, but it was very unlikely that he actually stopped. The Thorburns daycare was shut down in April 2016 when both their daycare and foster care approvals were suspended and things were about to get much worse for them. Six months after her murder, the info to crack this case wide open would finally arrive. It came in the form of a tip to Crime Stoppers, a tip that told them about a Facebook conversation between their youngest son, Trent, and his cousin. He states that he slept with Tia and was afraid that she might be pregnant. He was also afraid that he would go to jail since he was 18 at the time and she was only 12. He also told his cousin that Tia insisted that they have sex or that she was going to kill his dog. This is contrary to information that investigators received from a friend of Tia's who stated that Trent was actually the aggressor and Tia had even spoken to her foster mother about it. 
Trent's Facebook conversation with his cousin ended with him stating he was going to tell his parents that night, and that is the night before she disappeared. Police now consider the Thorburns prime suspects and place them under constant surveillance, even going as far as bugging their home. Several conversations with the family members were recorded discussing how to keep their secret and what to do and say if investigators figured out different aspects of the crime. The tapes also reveal that Tia never actually went to school that day at all and was taken care of the night before by Rick while the boys were at dance class and Julene was out of the home. In the tapes, Julene and Joshua also discuss protecting themselves if what Rick and Trent had done was ever figured out. There was a crack happening in the family and investigators knew where to put the pressure to get the family to break. Julene and Joshua were the first to come clean and opted to become witnesses against Rick. In September of 2016, recorded interviews with Julene and Joshua state that when they got home, Rick told them, quote, Tia is no longer with us. I hope you understand what that means. He refused to tell any of his family specifics of what he had done, but warned Julene not to go into Tia's bedroom. He also told his family to be out the following night on Friday uh, so that he could hide her body. Investigators believe he used the same car that he would use to drive her to school to transport her body to the river. The car driven by Rick was seized by police for a forensic examination, and Rick and Trent were detained for questioning. Investigators state that Rick may have tried to kill himself by taking a bunch of pills and collapsing right after his arrest. He had to be put in an induced coma for several days and even missed his first court appearance. Trent continued to deny any knowledge of the death of Tia, however, was charged with incest, perverting the course of justice, and two counts of perjury. He was sentenced to four years in jail, but released in January 2018 after serving 16 months. Rick was charged with murder, interfering with a corpse, perverting the course of justice, and two counts of perjury. Julene and Joshua also received charges, one count of perverting the course of justice and one charge of perjury for each of them as well. Julene and her two sons have now served their time and all three of them are now out of jail. Rick finally pleaded guilty to murder on May 25th of 2018 and was sentenced to life in jail. By doing this, he avoids having a trial and having to explain or try to defend what he had done to Tiali Palmer ne nearly three years ago. During his sentencing, Justice David Bodis said, your offending involves truly appalling conduct. You showed no respect for her, even in death. You murdered this defenseless child who relied on you for protection. Now at 57 years old, Rick will not be eligible for parole until September of 2036. Tia's biological mother, Cindy, was in the courtroom for Rick's sentencing. She made a statement to press, quote, Today's outcome marks a long and painful fight for justice for Tiali, but as her mother, no sentence will ever be enough. Tia's backpack and school uniform were never located, but thanks to a brave citizen and dedicated investigators, we still have a case cracked. Really terrible story. There's a couple of aspects that are kind of still floating around. Um, for me, one of them in particular was, was this really uh, a form of incest? We're talking about um, her being a foster child in this home situation. Uh, so I've looked into some of the legal definitions around that, and I can tell you it varies greatly. It varies um, in the US, it varies in Australia, it even gets down to different regions in Australia where the definition changes. Uh, a lot of their definitions have to do with uh, age, um, some of them are a bit general and they get as general as just saying close family members, which obviously this would fit into. Uh, some of them are a bit more defined than that, where it actually has to be at least a half blood relative. But obviously that's not what we have in this case. So um, obviously they were charged with it. So the area that they're in has that looser definition, uh, which obviously I think is is more than appropriate here. I mean, this is a, a 12 year old that, uh, you know, was looking to these guys as 
being her brothers uh, for, for 10 months. And there is some conversation. There's a politician that's kind of writing on this right now, um, really trying to raise the point of should she have ever been placed in a home that had two teenage boys? And, uh, you know, one of them, I think the younger one was 18. I think the older one is a year older or so. So even in terms of them being teenage, we're getting, I mean, from my perspective, they're in adulthood at that point. But is there really a point to not placing a girl that needs a home into a home because there's boys there? Uh, you know, this politician is specifically saying you have a prepubescent girl. Why did you put her in a home with two teenage boys? You know, almost like it's a common sense thing that can't you expect that something bad's going to happen? And I don't know for you guys. Let, let's talk about that in the comments a little bit. But for me, I don't know that we can assume that something bad was going to happen just because she was going to be living with two brothers. And where do you draw the lines around that? Like, how, how do you really contain that? Are you then going to only put her in a situation with uh, same sex siblings who may or may not be homosexual as well? Like, I, I just don't understand how the sex of the other children uh, should have been considered as some form of protecting her from this kind of situation. What we have in this situation is a terrible ordeal that happened just between her and the brother, but we have it compounded by a magnitude of a hundred or more by what the father did. Uh, essentially for the father to try to cover this up, to try to keep his son out of jail, uh, it's just, it's really gross. I mean, that's, that's really the biggest problem with all this. And if you look into the father's history, uh, you find out that the father himself actually went through being uh, fostered as well. Uh, has a bit of a history where at least seemingly he tells stories about kind of being involved in some crime and stuff in his younger days. So uh, I don't know if this would have really been completely out of the blue for that type of character. But obviously, that none of that information must have been charges that were heavy enough for them to not pass their background check for running a foster care or for doing foster care and running a daycare out of their home. Um, yeah, just just a terrible thing. But thankfully, no other children will be going to stay in that home. I'm, I'm pretty certain. Uh, I also wonder about Julene, about the wife and all this. I mean, how can you just... Uh, know that your husband has done something like that and just try to go along with hiding it. Um, I don't know. You know, I, I really try to put my, it's hard because none of us can really imagine ourselves into that situation and give a very accurate representation of what we could do. I would like to hope if I was in a situation where a close family member had harmed someone else in that type of way, that I would do the right thing. And maybe, maybe it would be an anonymous tip. Maybe it wouldn't be, maybe it would be a formal statement of some kind, but I would like to think that I would do the right thing in those situations. But quite honestly, until you're walking in those shoes, I don't know if we can ever really make that assumption or make that call. What do you guys think? Let's talk about it in the comments. Thank you so much for joining me here on this episode of Case Cracked. I appreciate each and every one of you out there, and I hope you'll come back tomorrow for more on the Lord and Arts channel.